Hello and welcome to Dateline London, the bomb attack on Boston, Robert Mugabe's apparently endless rule in Zimbabwe, and as British politicians reflect on the Thatcher legacy, are any of them really up to seizing the Thatcher mantle? My guests today are Sol Zadka of Our London, Ian Birrell of the Daily Mail, Nabil Ramdani, who's a French-Algerian writer, and Terrai Karak Makwenda of SW Radio Africa. Very good to see you all. Well, the motivation behind the bomb attack on the Boston Marathon remains a matter of speculation, although one suspect is dead, one in custody, and both have a background in Chechnya. What do we make of the attack itself, the possibility being discussed in the United States that the suspects radicalize themselves rather than being formally part of some kind of wider group? And also, the reshaping of both Al-Qaeda and the intelligence services since 9-11. I mean, there is still a lot of speculation going on. Uh, uh, President Obama wants to find out what the motivation is, as does everybody else. But what do, what do you make of what we know so far, Nabila? Well, of course, as you say, we need to work out what really spark, what is it that sparks this sudden uh, need for extreme violence and, and how this the American dream turns into a nightmare. But I think what this story really tells us is that in my view, gun uh, weapons are far too freely available in American society and that violence is far too easily used as well. And so and you see it as a, uh, because this is part of the discussion, isn't it? Whether this is American homegrown terrorism, even though they've got Chechen roots, or whether it's something else with possible links to radical Islam, Al-Qaeda, foreign fighters, and so on. I think it's a simple story about gun control, in, in my view. I think that young people in America have the impression that uh, violence, is, massive violence, is part and parcel of their culture. And whatever, whatever the motive of, of the perpetrators of these atrocities, they were typical American youngsters who used violence to devastating effect. So? Well, I can reveal to President Obama that one of the brothers, uh, of these Chechen brothers, went to Chechnya last year where there is a great deal of Salafist movement influence. I'm talking about uh, Mahachkala, the capital city of Dagestan, next door to Chechnya, where his father lives. And he met with some members of a group called uh, Sharia Jamaat, which means the group of the Sharia. They are trying to implement the Sharia rule. And he received some orders from them, and this led to the bombing of the uh, Boston Marathon. I think it was completely ideologically and religiously motivated. And part of a group rather than two, two guys uh, who just... Because actually, you know, a lot of information is available on the internet as well as a lot of things that could radicalize people. But th th your information suggests part of a group. I think, no, there, are, there were two individuals. In fact, the old brother influence is, is, is the young one. And he received some orders from uh, uh, pro Al Qaeda elements in Chechnya and Dagestan. The thing is that they received uh, their instructions how to prepare a pressure cook uh, bomb from the available Al Qaeda uh, various websites on the internet, as the group that the, the so called uh, the Luton gang that have been jailed three uh, days ago have been doing all the time, you know, uh, getting in touch with the famous uh, uh, Inspire magazine of Al Qaeda and seeing exactly under the influence of the late uh, Alawlaki, the head preacher who was killed by the Americans in Yemen, how to prepare a bomb in your mother's kitchen. That's exactly what happened. Oh, what's, in interesting, yeah. what's interesting here, I mean, you know, a, a person does not get radicalized from one trip uh, uh, to Chechnya. The thing is, what was happening in his life before that? You don't just turn like that in one trip. And we know that these kids did not grow up in Chechnya. I mean, you know, uh, basically born in uh, Kyrgyzstan, um, uh, parents moved to uh, Dagestan when the war broke out there, and then from Dagestan moved to the United States. So what was happening while they were in the States? That's where they spent the majority yeah. of their lives. And so it's the, not really, yeah. uh, th this Chechnya and Thai, I think it's too soon for us to, 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 to really dwell on that. Maybe, maybe not. We don't know yet. But I think this has taught us a lot uh, in terms of the media. Um, about putting out information before we are sure. And we all saw as the story developed, it's, oh, he's been shot in a boat, he's dead, the, the younger brother, and then that changed. Uh, so we need to sort of slow down, I think, and, and take time to learn what, what made these kids yeah. this way. I think you're touching on something there, because I think what we're really seeing, again, as we saw in Spain and we've seen in Britain, is this thing where you get second generation kids who grow up in a, in a society mm -hmm. and they go to school there and are well educated and all the rest of it, but something turns, they become embittered about it and they develop this sort of mythologized vision of their religion 
and of their society and in their anger they find a way and perhaps they are radicalized and they use the internet and they go to extremist source and they end up in these these obscene places where, where by the carrying out an attack like that and I think really the link is much closer uh, I don't quite agree it's just about the violence in America I think the link is more about the second generation it's back it's linked to some of the atrocities that we have seen yeah, in, in Europe absolutely. also but doesn't it sadly fits in with a narrative that we're seeing far too much of in across America at the moment which is that of young people taking up arms against their own and surely the availability of weapons has a, a lot to do with that and I mean this story is typically about young Americans living the American dream they, they, they are uh, sons of immigrant backgrounds which is what America is all about uh, they were described by family and friends as good kids. Uh, but I see it as part and parcel of an undeniable sickness right at the heart of American society. And the fact that we've just seen Obama's gun control measures wholeheartedly rejected highlights the difficulty in dealing with, with this very sickness. Well, I, yeah. I don't disagree with what you're saying about gun control, but how does that differ from the kids who in, in Spain or in Britain found other way, ways to express their anger and their bitterness, not through the guns, but through explosives. When, when people are radicalized in this way, there will always be an outlet that I they can they can find a method to do it. Now, I'm not, it's I'm much not saying more that gun control is... It would be much more difficult to express your anger but in that manner but than but any other... But I think it's done. wrong to see it as just a story yes. about America, because these people, yeah. you know, their families embrace really the history of the 20th century as well. If you look, you know, part of the Stalin exiles of Chechens, going back onto Khrushchev, etc., etc., ending up in America, and then, then this sort of nightmarish... Indeed, so. yes. President Kadyrov, by the way, president of Chechnya, he accused the American education system for the radicalization of those two brothers. He said, what do you want from us? We haven't been seeing them for the last 12 years or so. They have been growing up in America. But can, but yeah, can, yeah, can, we, can we touch on just a, a slightly wider point here, which is about this question about radicalization, which is a theme which goes to, to many different countries and very different cultures. I mean, are we in a situation where, rather like the Cold War, there is some kind of uh, se there's security aspect and military aspect and so on, but there's a war of ideas. And there are plenty of ideas that are available to, to everybody on the internet it's very easy to get them and it's very easy for some people disaffected second generation people or otherwise to become radicalized and that that is a place that we should look at as much as you know being able to put tanks on the streets because you're worried about bombs going off absolutely and I agree that there is a parallel or even similarity between the two brothers in Boston to some of the um, Muslim Pakistani young generations youth who have been dwelling with the idea of trying to commit jihad in the place that has absorbed them and absorbed their, their parents and gave them all the opportunities in life. And you are right, one does not have to go to training camps in Pakistan in order to absorb this kind of uh, jihad ideology. You can only sit in front of the computer and be influenced by the hate preachers, by Al-Qaeda websites, by all these kind of things which will make them more committed to uh, act against the people who are living with them. Yeah, and I think Gavin touched on something there, which is, I mean, if you look at uh, someone like Mohammed Khan, uh, who was one of the um, guys accused in the 7-7, um, uh, July 7th uh, bombing, um, uh, well-educated, mm -hmm. well-integrated into British society, same as uh, uh, these kids. They're, they're young. Same they're as the Glasgow airport bombing, uh, there's exactly. a number of others. And, and the, as you say, this guy was wanting to be a doctor. The uh, exactly, a brain surgeon, uh, um, to, to be specific. And uh, there are a lot of young kids, especially now with this global economic downturn, where there are a lot of kids just hanging around, not much to do, and have access to all this information online. They, they can't get a job because the jobs are not there. They get very, very um, angry with the, what they call the system in in general and when you have time on your hands I mean a pressure cooker is not difficult to find you buy that in any uh, shop so it's not we go beyond even just gun control and it can it's be like really easy ingredients to find it really can be anything that motivates these people I mean we don't know about these uh, young people we, we might find out we might not but if you watch the you mentioned the seven seven bombers for mm -hmm. example if you watch their videos they talk about Afghanistan they talk about Iraq they talk about you know Western foreign policy so there might be a connection with that and there might not and, and the question equally, of whether websites like uh, Al Qaeda's uh, what is it Inspire. called Inspire whether websites like that should exist where you can get simple instructions to make a bomb. All those questions come into play now. The one thing I would add is that when you talk about a battle of ideas, we have to always remember these are tiny, tiny groups. And it's the, the real danger, I think, is that we see another rise of Islamophobia, which has been something which has slightly scarred our societies in the last 10 years. Now, there would be a and backlash. We don't want to, yeah, we don't want to see... There would be, be a backlash against Muslims backlash. in America. There's Let's no not forget, yeah. one of the first people injured was a Saudi runner 
yeah. and he was immediately treated as a suspect That's when right, he yeah. was someone just taking mm -hmm. part in the event. So the key, I don't think we shouldn't give too much credence to the battle of ideas. We should understand the causes and, and the, the psychology and the internet and We've, seen, the we've internet already seen incidents of people internet. being thrown out of buses for speaking Arabic but, in yeah. Boston. But some of the headlines yeah. were completely irresponsible. I mean, they were fueling exactly what mm. you're talking about. The Jihad brothers. I mean, yeah. it, it, yeah. Ironically, President Assad of Syria took advantage of what happened in Boston and he's, he told uh, uh, an interviewer uh, on Wednesday, we in Syria are having a Boston every day and the Americans do not understand it. Okay, let's move on. Because uh, the good news for many parts of Africa in recent years is one of economic opportunity, higher commodity prices and in many cases better governance than in the past. One exception Zimbabwe, where the regime of Robert Mugabe clings on and where this week the country has been celebrating, if that's the right word, its independence. With so much change all around him, how does Mugabe do it and with what consequences for what should be a prosperous country? Uh, how have the celebrations for independence been? Um, the consensus is we got independence but we got no basic freedoms and, and those are the words that uh, Prime Minister Morgan Changirai um, used this week, um, this past Thursday uh, during independence. No basic freedoms. Just last week a United Nations mission which was going to the country um, to assess the situation on the ground in order to decide whether to give us money for elections or not was blocked from entering the country because ZANU-PF, Robert Mugabe's party, wants the money with no conditions doesn't want any conditions. Don't tell us what to do, just give us your money. This was a United Nations mission blocked from entering the country. Uh, we celebrated independence at a time when this coalition government that um, uh, the MDC and Morgan Changrai went into um, is basically powerless. Um, you know, Mugabe still runs the army, the police, they still back him, and he is again, at his old age, the only candidate that's going to run for president for ZANU. PF. So he will win. Uh, you think the elections will go ahead in, in May? Um, well, Mugabe says he wants the elections at the uh, end of June. June oh, 29th June. is the date that he's been uh, insisting. But the other uh, parties in government do not want that. They say it's too early. They want him in September. Um, are you and disappointed it, by Changarai? Uh, uh, many people are disappointed because uh, Zimbabweans sort of view them as having become comfortable. You have to remember a lot of these guys were poor. All of a sudden you're in the coalition government, you're given a four by four, a monthly salary, and people are saying they've become comfortable and forgotten where they came from and what they were fighting um, for. We're going to have elections with most of the reforms that they agreed to when they formed this coalition not having been implemented. There's still no free media, there's still no uh, freedom, basic freedoms of assembly and the right to protest and none of that exists. Uh, a prominent lawyer is under arrest for having gone to the police to represent arrested mm. activists. So there's still no freedoms in Zimbabwe. Uh, Ian, you write very often about some of the very good news, uh, good things that happen in Africa. Zimbabwe must be a real disappointment to many people because it should be a much more prosperous country than it is. Well, of course, actually, it is growing quite fast, so we shouldn't forget that. But yeah, no, of course, it's, it's horrific. You know, you've still got Mugabe's really the front man for uh, a small group of officers at the top of the army and the security forces who are controlling the country and fleecing the country and stealing all the mineral wealth, particularly from the diamond mines. So you have got that. But again, it's not a unique story. You know, you can point to other countries. A lot of the African success is despite the governments, not because of the governments. And, and poor governance still remains a very big problem for all the change and the, the spread of democracy that is going on. There are too many countries still which have the same rulers uh, milking the system, milking the country. And you know, have to look at somewhere like Uganda, where Museveni came to power saying that the biggest problem in Africa is, is a big man who won't leave power. And you know, he's still there several decades later. And you know, he's doing very well out of it with his nice big home and all the rest of it. The governor of uh, Zimb the Bank of Zimbabwe announced a couple of days ago that the country has only $167 in its coffers, not in its pocket, in the entire account of the Bank of Zimbabwe. And, and Mugabe celebrated his 89th birthday a couple of days ago in the football stadium in which he was given a, a huge um, uh, keg and also 89 uh, dollars, each dollar for every year of his life. And the party itself cost $600,000. However, I think you should mention also that there is today in Zimbabwe a constitutional uh, a referendum. Mm. Well, the, 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 refer the referendum was, uh, was held. Um, yeah. 
uh, already last month. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but this is after an extremely expensive outreach program in which they went around the country asking people, what would you like to see in your constitution? It was approved the, by 95 percent. Yeah, yeah, but the problem but is that it. what the people said they wanted uh, in, in terms of you know, the, the, the constitution was then ignored because ZANU-PF, again, Robert Mugabe's party, refused um, uh, to honor much of what the people said they wanted, and uh, they put in their own sort of demands as to what they wanted to see in the mm -hmm. Constitution. And that was negotiated between the three parties. So this expensive exercise was pointless. The referendum is pointless because it's, it, the Constitution is a negotiated document by three parties. And as soon as it ended, of course, four, four key advisors to, um, were rounded up, and so Svangari rounded up, and the lawyer was taken in, radios exactly. were banned. You, know, you saw all the stuff which is, and although it went quite peacefully, the indications are that because the election is in the balance, that the repression is going to start and it's going to be a pretty mm. horrific exactly. run-up to the election. I think we pretty much all agree to say that Zimbabwe, unfortunately, doesn't have much to celebrate. Uh, and it's, there's always something deeply depressing about any country which has been led by the same person for, for decades. Uh, of course, you know, we had Gaddafi uh, ruling over uh, Libya for 40 years, and here we have Mugabe 30 years, marking 33 years uh, since Ian Smith uh, ceded power to him. And, and Mugabe really has come to personify pretty much everything that's wrong with, with, dare I say, Africa, and let alone Zimbabwe. I mean, he's still presiding over a country whose economy is in tatters, you know, unemployment and poverty are endemic, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, political strife and repression are, are also commonplace. And he's uh, stated, the stated aim of his uh, land reform, which was effectively a noble one to take uh, white-owned commercial farms to hand over to black, uh, to black people with no lands, led to a disaster. It led to the, uh, to the collapse of a, an economy which is largely based on agriculture, with a and sharp fall in production, and, and that's people absolutely right. uh, living on grain handouts. I presume the, the only way, the way to stop the, Zimbabwe, the Mugabe era is to stop a certain private hospital in Singapore from providing him with treatment for prostate cancer. But oh. Mugabe is just one person. <laughs> well, Mugabe is well, just as, a front as a final man. It's, easy to, get, yeah. it's yeah. easy to get too hung up on Mugabe. You know, he is at the, st exactly. at the peak of a small group of people who are running the country. And also, I think we have to be careful of drawing parallels from Africa from this. You know, Africa is a continent mm -hmm. of more than 50 countries. And you don't say that Europe is all bad because of what's happening in France or in Germany or in Russia. And I do yeah, think and, we need to remember and it. And the final you know, point to remember, too, that, that, that's absolutely right. And, and another point to remember is that, you know, we have diamonds uh, that were discovered in Zimbabwe now. And last year, at least $800 million worth of diamond exports, um, uh, you know, brought money to the country. But only $45 million of that $800 million made it to the national treasury, which means all of that money is going to supporting the Mugabe regime. OK, let's move on. Because um, over the years, many American politicians on the right have tried to wear the mantle of their great hero, Ronald Reagan. In Venezuela, as we see, the new President Maduro is trying to wear the mantle of his predecessor, Hugo Chavez. In the week of the funeral of Baroness Thatcher, David Cameron suggested we're all Thatcherites. Opinion polls show that many conservatives wish their party had another Mrs. Thatcher to lead them. So is it actually quite dangerous for politicians to make any comparisons with big figures from the past because the comparison isn't good for their image? What do, what do you make of all that and how, you know, it's been a quite an extraordinary week with the funeral of Mrs. Thatcher, the tributes paid. Is there a Thatcher mantle that people want to grab hold of? I think it's been quite difficult actually for, for the government and for the Prime Minister in particular to negotiate his way through this because people always look back at the past and say where are the statesmen, why, why don't people compare so well as with people in the past. For him also Thatcher was a divis divisive figure in this country and to some extent some of his early modernisation was going against what she said while also a lot of the modernisation in terms of what he's doing to the economy and to schools and to public services is extending and continuing. So it's been a very difficult thing for him to negotiate the way through it and actually I think he's done he's done it quite successfully whereby um, he's avoiding too much comparison and equally avoiding too much flack over it. I take it nobody will be trying to 
have the mantle of Mugabe upon them. <laughs> not, not many. But what, what, what but, do you but make there of is, what's going on But there is one here? African leader, um, you know, Mandela, Mandela. Who everyone, you know, and who's going to be able to live up to uh, because that. Because he, he did what Mugabe didn't do, which is he left Exactly. Office. He left exactly. power. And, uh, and, the, and that's a lesson they all should have learned, you know, leave while you're still popular. Because well, Mandela could still walk around the poorest parts of South Africa alone with no bodyguard. There are, and they would, there are some people who would say that's true also of Mrs. Thatcher and Tony Blair. <laughs> But from an African, from an African uh, uh, perspective, it, it's been interesting um, what other leaders have said about her, and it's, I think it's, it, it, it says a lot about the lady because uh, F. W. D. Clerk, I think, um, wrote quite an interesting piece. Um, he said that um, Thatcher helped bring uh, peace to South Africa. Uh, and independence um, by bringing together not only uh, F. W. de Klerk himself, who was the last president under apartheid, he brought him and Nelson Mandela and Chief Buthalazi together, and that she, he said, was able to see that change was already coming to South Africa. By 1983, um, so-called coloreds and Indians had been included in parliament, black uh, unions had been given um, quite extensive rights, and uh, the government had already realized that they're going to have to give more power to blacks. So, so it was already changing, and Thatcher saw this and did not want to jeopardize that change and that, that, that speed of reform. But the rest of the world did not see this. According to de Klerk, uh, they wanted to redouble the, the sanctions that were being put against the apartheid uh, 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 regime. And because Thatcher insisted, let's not double uh, these sanctions, let's engage the South Africans and, 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 and bring change without any more fighting, without any more loss of blood. And he credits her for having brought all these three elements together, and he says only her iron will made that happen. Do you, do you think there is a there is a Thatcher mantle, and, and as Ian suggests, people politicians have got to be really careful about how they invite comparisons with the past. Yes, and I certainly think it would be very dangerous for the Conservative Party, in particular, to be looking for a Thatcher type character now. I think she, you know, whatever your views on her, she was very much a woman of her type. She was this big divisive beast who was there to fight the, you know, the great battles of post-war Britain. And the, the truth is we live in a far more conciliatory age, far more consensual, where, you We've know... We've got a coalition government. Exactly. <laughs> and discussions are less polarised, far less polarised. And uh, the Telegraph is actually asking today, does David Cameron has the stomach for a fight like Lady Thatcher did? The straightforward answer is no. He's a far more relaxed, shy story who has, he's the type to, who's proved to be electable precisely because the, uh, the Conservative Party had this tag about being the nasty party and he, he, he's undone all that. But also, he, I mean, she had thumping majorities for the Conservative Party and he hasn't. He just yes, hasn't got yes, that. Yes, indeed. He hasn't got that. And, and she was the kind of dogged politicians with, you know, conviction that we do not see anymore. So, I mean, was there, a, I don't know, was there a, a Ben-Gurion mantle? Do, do Israeli politicians try to measure up to the well, past? Having another Ben-Gurion in Israel would be a catastrophe. As much as having another Thatcher in our generation would be completely unnecessary. I was covering as a journalist Margaret Thatcher's last two terms in office almost on a daily basis, and I had a great respect for her, which I lost to a degree after her funeral, after she died, because it, it seems to me that soon after she left forced out of Downing Street, she was pestering three prime ministers about her funeral. And she wanted a funeral in St. Paul with all the hallmarks of a state ceremonial funeral, which made me think and quite uncomfortably think that this uh, uh, funeral had a kind of uh, political undertones to it, which I did not really like. It was like a uh, Nacrophilia display in many, many ways. And this put her in a slightly, relatively negative light, as far as I'm concerned. That's, and w are you surprised with your reaction to that, given that you admired many of the things that she did? That's right. I, I think that she served Britain uh, from being a third world country run by hot headed trade union bosses. But uh, after a while, she, she lost the plot. I mean, the details of what she did was pretty painful, and uh, certainly. Yeah, but you it know, was bound to be painful if she wanted to, to serve the country to a certain extent. But I understood why her so called friends well, you, wanted to get rid of her at the end of the decade. But that's the thing about being um, uh, strong willed and having is that, is that, you know, when you're right, um, and you stick to it, it, it works very well. And when you're wrong and you're not open and you still have that strong will, yeah. you could do damage to a lot of people. And, and I think uh, the consensus among global leaders is that 
you know, that was a good quality to have. But when you come back home here, and that's where I think a lot of the damage was done, and that's where people are quite unhappy with it. Because when you're wrong, you hurt a lot of people and you're not open to. Has, that, has any of this, do you think any of this have changed David Cameron or the way he approaches things? Because the facts are, as I suggested, he doesn't have the majority. So he can't do a Thatcher, whatever people want in the Telegraph or elsewhere. But equally, the other fact is he has to be pretty resolute because he's set on an economic course. And uh, it would be disastrous for him to turn his back on that. And in a way, it's a far, it's as tough a gig, if not tougher, than some of the things Margaret Thatcher had to do, given the economic circumstances. Plus, he's trying to do various reforms. So in many ways, um, I think he can benefit to some extent just when people actually delve a little bit below, below the terrible headlines and the silliness of the coalition politics and look at some of the things he's doing. You can actually see some a line between the two leaders, if, if despite the fact they are so of, different. If she was not forced out of office by the Conservative colleagues, she would go on and on and on, being in Downing Street for about 30 years, like Robert <laughs> <laughs> Well, that would depend slightly more on the British voters, <laughs> who, 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 who may... Uh, uh, but uh, do, you think, do you think in terms of, you know, that after the, the funeral and after this is now settled down, uh, that uh, th there will be a lot that still lasts? of the Thatcherite legacy that we're all Thatcherites now? Or do you think that's just a bit of hyperbole in a, 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 in a week where a lot of, there was a lot of emotions within the Conservative Party? I think there was a lot of emotion. It'll soon fade into the past. And what it does allow the country to do is to somehow come to terms with a very divisive era and analyse what it really meant and reflect on it and hopefully to move on into a very different era that we live in today. Okay, we'll move on now because that's it for Dateline London for this week. Uh, we'll be back next week at the same time. You can comment on the programme on Twitter at Gavin Esler, hashtag Dateline London. Thanks for watching and goodbye.